Welcome to the Waiting Room Revolution. On this episode, we talk with Dr. Harvey Chachanoff, a distinguished professor of psychiatry at the University of Manitoba. We chat about some highlights of his prolific research career developing dignity therapy. We talk about what it is and how that's applicable, not just to dying patients, but to getting the best care possible. And we chat about his new book, which is available now. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Harvey, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Really delighted to be here. We're so excited to have you on our podcast. Yes, well, the excitement is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey, so you're a clinician, a prolific healthcare researcher, and one of the things you are most well known for is the creation of dignity therapy. So can you tell us more about what is dignity therapy? Dignity therapy then is a, uh, is a brief individualized psychotherapy, a conversation mm -hmm. that you have with somebody that in essence allows them to convey their thread, who they are and what they value and what they would want known, what they would want said, um, you know, what wishes they would want extended to the people that they're about to leave behind. Those conversations are recorded, transcribed, and given to people in the form of either what we call a legacy or generativity document. And as, as, as Sien has pointed out, and, and it sort of has now become part of the uh, kind of the armamentarium, it's become part of the lexicon of, of palliative care and palliative care uh, interventions in terms of psychological support. And as a follow-up, What's the origin story of that? I mean, how did you start this amazing, huge body of work on dignity therapy? I began studying uh, various different uh, psychiatric dimensions of, uh, of end-of-life care uh, a, a very, very long time ago. <laughs> makes me sound like I'm a dinosaur, but I mean, in some ways, maybe uh, in the Canadian palliative care world, maybe I am a dinosaur. But um, we were interested at the time uh, as we were studying things like depression and anxiety and desire for death and will to live and had you know many studies that we were publishing on these areas we began looking at some of the experience in uh, the benelux countries where euthanasia and assisted suicide was uh, available was being practiced and what we were particularly interested in knowing uh, was not so much how often uh, these medical decisions to end life were being carried out, uh, although that certainly is of interest, but we wanted to know uh, what was the motivation for people who no longer wanted to live, uh, to, to seek out a hasten death, uh, because our, our supposition always was that if we can get that, if we can understand why people no longer want to be here, that's got to give us some kind of a better handle on understanding uh, end of life care. In, in fact, it's it's funny I'm saying this today because I mean that was I mean several decades ago, and today I, I'm working on an article and it's, it's an article on uh, on made an editorial that I've uh, been putting together, and one of the lines that I've just been trying to craft is basically saying if we can understand motivations around made and why people are seeking this out it's gonna have the dual effect of leading to better maid practices in Canada, but also it will lead to better palliative care for people whose suffering mm -hmm. expresses itself as the wish to no longer want to live. Mm -hmm. Back to the issue of, of, of dignity then, what we discovered when we looked at the literature uh, from the Benelux countries is that the, the primary motivation uh, at least according to Dutch physicians who were involved in death hastening practices, was that uh, their patient had sought out a hasten death because of lost sense of dignity. Mm -hmm. This was astounding to us. Uh, I mean, more so than any other reason, you know, uh, pain or pain as part of a constellation of symptoms, unworthy dying, tiredness of life, lost sense of dignity was the most highly cited reason for why patients had sought out uh, a, a hasten death. Mm -hmm. And it was really that finding that got us launched into, you know, what has turned out to be, you know, many, many years, a couple of, of, of decades worth of studies on the issue of dignity and mm -hmm. how to understand it, how to un un unravel it and, and how to explicate that, that notion of, of dignity at end of life. 
It's led to uh, outcome measures like the, the patient dignity inventory, but then also led to the creation of um, dignity therapy, which is based on an empirical model of dignity. So we had done some, some qu quantitative studies, but also qualitative studies, developed this model, and the model basically said, here are all the things you better know about with respect to dignity if you are going to get a good handle on how to preserve it or if you want to know the things that might undermine it these are the things you need to be watching out for so harvey sorry to interrupt but that begs the question of what are what are some of the key domains or elements so um one of the discoveries in the dignity model was this notion of generativity uh, that patients said, the th uh, amongst many other variables that were included in the model, one of the things that could undermine my sense of dignity as I'm approaching death is a sense of, you know, my life not having stood for much, uh, not, not, not there, there not being a sense of meaning or purpose or, 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 or a ripple effect that, you know, um, you know, in other words, what, what's it all about? I mean, the fact that I was here, what will that have changed? Whose life will that have changed? Will there be any kind of remnant uh, of my having been here. So that provided a, a, a clue that if we were to engage people in a psychological intervention, a, a conversation, if you will, there needed to be something lasting or permanent, which is where the idea of a recorded conversation that would be transcribed, uh, edited, and returned to that person so they could bequeath it to uh, those who would soon be mourning their passing. Then we said, well, okay, so if, if that's the case, I mean, what are we what are we supposed to talk about? I mean, what is dignity therapy comprised of? And again, going back to the model, I mean, many of the things that people talked about uh, as preserving or undermining dignity had to do with personhood. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, will people know my story? Will people know, you know, what I, what, what some people have called, will people know my thread? Mm -hmm. um, do I have, do, will people understand the things that are meaningful, the things that gave me purpose, the, uh, the accomplishments, the roles that I've held? So those begin, oh, and, and something called aftermath concerns, which is, will I be able to say things that will lessen the burden of my death on the people who survive me uh, by virtue of the words that I can share with them or instruction or guidance or comfort? So. We have then the, the form of dignity therapy is this um, kind of generativity, preservation of, of their words in a document. The content is, you know, uh, around those issues pertaining to personhood. And then the tone of dignity therapy was informed by things like care tenor um, and, and social support, which really is about being kind of non-judgmental, uh, attentive, uh, affirming. I absolutely love the dignity therapy. Like I, I remember learning about it and feeling like firecrackers had gone off. It was so incredible in every way. So useful, utilizable, easy, um, comfortable. I want to know if you've had uh, done any research or has anyone done any research on when people um, know to uh, offer dignity therapy or what are the triggers for dignity therapy? Um, sure. Sometimes that's the hardest part when there is a beautiful intervention or tool or whatever, that it makes so much sense, but then people just still don't know when to enter onto the scene. Yeah, very good. Um, so originally when, when we devised dignity therapy, um, I mean, it was being uh, done and conducted in, um, you know, the setting of palliative care. So we, I mean, the initial patients that we uh, saw were for, for um, for the most part, were, were patients who were on a palliative care ward. Um, mm -hmm. we, we then began also uh, providing it for people who were uh, being looked after in the community, but were on the palliative care service. But in essence, it was, a, it was an end of life intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, with the uh, admission criteria for palliative care programs. So these are people who usually have a life expectancy of you know, somewhere in the magnitude of fewer than, than six months. Yeah. What's what's happened over time 
is that people have come to the realization that dignity therapy uh, may have applications outside the immediate context of, of approaching end of life. And even we ourselves did some studies where we um, invited uh, people who were living in, in personal care homes. Uh, so these are seniors who aren't imminently dying, but certainly are at a time in their life when reflection and the preservation of story uh, feels meaningful. Mm -hmm. So what, what I, uh, when people say, well, how do you know somebody is, is a good candidate or is ready? Um, I think about something that I have called or, or referred to as kind of an existential readiness. Mm -hmm. So when do I feel that I've come to a point in life where reflection, you know, sharing of story, you know, something that is summative mm -hmm. feels meaningful and feels important in terms of where I'm at uh, existentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this existential readiness, I think, is, a, is, is an important concept because in some ways what it does is it, it removes dignity therapy from being seen as strictly an end of life. Yeah intervention, you know, yeah. like you know, write your will, you know, and, and make sure you've got your dignity therapy done. It's just so interesting because with the work that we've done, uh, Sienna and I, we also came from a place of understanding what people were needing and wanting at the end of life and trying to, to the best of our ability, truck that upstream and position it somewhere earlier in the care journey, which didn't reek of, oh, we're just trying to improve your dying and your death experience, that this is actually something that will help you remain intact with who you identify yourself as. Um, and we had to really, in a way, wash it of, you know, words like palliative, death, dying. Uh, we couldn't take our scary interventions from the end of life and just pull them upstream and insert them. So, uh, but in a way you have found that your, this um, intervention is helpful uh, at quite a distance from just end of life, that there's all these different um, populations and care settings and circumstances where uh, people benefit from being reminded of who they are and where they've come from and where they want to go. And if you, and if you look at uh, the dignity therapy protocol, and if you look at the things uh, that are contained in the dignity therapy protocol, uh, it, it does not include the word death. Yeah. And, and it's not that we're trying to avoid the word death. I mean, there, you know, there's been very many instances where in the course of dignity therapy, uh, people say that they want to reflect on their illness or even reflect on, you know, the fact that in some instances they're dying or approaching death. But that is not, but, but that is not what the protocol is uh, necessarily about mm -hmm. and, and they're not words that are included in the, the protocol itself or even introducing the protocol mm -hmm. you know uh, i mean i'll say to people you know this is a form of uh brief individualized therapy that mm -hmm. many people find helpful at a time mm -hmm. when they're dealing with illness it's an opportunity for them to reflect on their lives and the things that are meaningful to them and that matter to them i mean that's the kind of language that we that we use and and you're right it it, it very much is about um affirmation because mm -hmm. i think again one of the the big challenges that people face when whether they're uh, approaching death or whether they're just living with a condition that is undermining their sense of vitality and intactness is a sense of you know am i still me mm -hmm. and can we provide something that reminds them of who they are, who they want to be. So I, I think this word affirmation is a really important one in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious, you know, in this world of modern medicine where it's about, you know, new treatments and bigger machines and technology, what, when you started, what, do, what was the reception from the broader medical community um, to really a psychological intervention? Um, the the the, re, the reception is as i recall it and and it it was not so much from the the broader medical community but from uh, i think the uh you know the broader palliative care community um was uh, i think actually 
quite positive. Um, in fact, very positive because there seemed uh, to be something that was incredibly intuitive about this. So, I mean, and even when, you know, um, a study might come out and, you know, it was equivocal in its findings um, or it showed that, you know, dignity of therapy affected this, but it didn't affect, you know, some other dimension. Um, by and large, you know, what people would say is, you know, well, there, there may be a problem with the way that we're trying to measure um, something that is as ephemeral um, as dignity therapy can be in terms of its impact, but there is something so intuitive about it um, that uh, people felt that this is something that um, would find its place in palliative care and, and, and quickly did find a place in, in, in palliative care. And that it is certainly, you know, um, I mean, if you look at any standard textbook of, of palliative care um, that deals with, you know, psychological care, uh, dignity therapy will be, you know, uh, in, included amongst those. But when I talk about, you know, kind of this things that are ephemeral, uh, you know, I, I, I think back of, I mean, and, and at this point, I mean, I've done many, many uh, sessions of dignity therapy with patients. And I, I don't know why this is coming to mind, but I, I recall uh, one woman who said that the only time she ever heard her father say that he loved her was in the context of him doing his dignity therapy. And so you say, okay, so what impact does that have you know so the the empiricist says okay um did we you know let's what was her hads before and after you know uh, love exposure you know what 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 did she measure on you know on on the back and you say really i mean really i mean that's the standard that you're going to hold us to i mean this this woman has just told us about this profound effect this profound influence and again I, I mean it's just one of scores of stories that i could tell about the way people have been influenced touched moved it is it is hard sometimes you know in in the world of kind of empiricism and research to find ways of of showing uh, effect sizes particularly when you know there are ceiling effects and you know you don't control for the amount of initial distress that people may have initially when they are admitted to your trial so studying these things um and, and trying to prove you know outcomes as and, and listen, you, you know uh, you live in the world of of research and empirical work it, it's it's not an easy task but again dignity therapy at least at this point has the benefit like me of aging and with age, you know, comes exposure to uh, many, many different trials so that people have been able to test this in so many different contexts. So we're beginning to see the places where dignity therapy performs well, and we're beginning to see the places where dignity therapy may perform well, but measuring that outcome uh, just takes a different kind of tack that oftentimes means, you know, the, you know, kind of a, a qualitative exploration of what the experience was like for those participants. Okay, Ooh. Uh, so, okay, so my follow-up to that is um, something that you said earlier, which was the, the reception from the palliative care community was quite positive and the research has shown that. Has there been uptake in non-palliative care specialists? Because it, it, it seems to me that many, the, the underlying, um, you know, ethos principle behind this is about um, seeing people, meeting them where they're at, understanding what's important to them, um, which could really be applied to all practitioners, um, family doctors, ICU doctors, and in, in all, really all medical interactions. So I'm curious if, uh, you know, the story behind the spread of dignity therapy beyond palliative care specialists. Well, um, I would say for the most part, I mean, the I mean, the brief, you know, psychological intervention coined dignity therapy, you know, has been and I think largely remains um, a, a, a palliative care phenomenon. Um, the, the place where maybe I've, I've managed to make some inroads beyond palliative care is in what I call the patient dignity question. So this is the, the so the, the, the patient dignity question or the PDQ uh, reads, um, you know, what 
do I know, need to know about you as a person in order to take the best care of you possible? Um, you know, people have said, you know, they have called a kind of dignity therapy light. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's quite accurate, but I mean, if there's a commonality, it's that it recognizes that we need to um, be able to somehow affirm that uh, people, uh, that patients are people um, with feelings that matter. We need to be able to acknowledge who the person is, not just the ailment they have, but we need to acknowledge um, the person that they are. And the PDQ or the patient dignity question has become um, kind of a, a relatively easy, accessible, elegant way of, of engaging people in these brief conversations, you know, five to 10 minutes, where, again, you're not creating a permanent document. This isn't about the creation of legacy. This is just a way of being able to put who I am on your clinical radar. Um, one case example, and I used it just recently in some teaching I was doing, was the daughter of a First Nations woman who was a residential school survivor. Um, and the daughter told us that another sibling of hers, uh, so this daughter's sister, had gone missing and how her mother had, you know, looked for her for years, had become an advocate for missing and murdered uh, Aboriginal women. Um, and how this woman was really um, a, a role model and, you know, how active she was in, in her community and an inspiration. And at the end of the PDQ, and what we do is we, we listen to the response, we summarize it, and then we call the person back on, on the phone, or if it's at the bedside, we go back to the bedside and we read it to them. We make any changes that they want made. And then the litmus test is, do we have your permission to place this on your medical chart? I can tell you without exception, everybody says mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Why? They're saying, this is how I want you to see me. You know, mm -hmm. you know, this is how I want you to experience me. And this, this woman, this uh, child of this woman uh, who was now in intensive care said, you know, I've been struggling, you know, throughout the time my mother's been in hospital, I've been struggling to try and find a way of letting people know that she's just no ordinary patient. Mm -hmm. And by the way, nobody wants their loved one to be seen mm -hmm. as a patient or an or because nobody is an ordinary patient when you bring personhood into the conversation. And, and she concluded by saying, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, this PDQ has allowed me to show mm -hmm. the medical staff who my mother really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, similarly, but not as um, intense, but the reason why people put pictures beside their loved one, you know, in the ICU, uh, this is not just person 247 in bed 7A by the window. This is a person with a picture here, bike riding with a family, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I have a confession to make. Uh, if that's okay, will you receive it? I, I, I'm not a member of the clergy. I, I am a psychiatrist, and, 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 I'm, and I'm happy to hear your confession. I, I don't, I'm not saying I can offer absolution, but I will hear your confession, uh, Samantha. Well, I just feel like I have to say this because I have so many students that ride along with me on home visits in, in patients' homes, and <clears throat> I use your questions all the time. Um, you know, what do I need to know about you to provide the best care? Uh, when we come out of the house, the students are like bamboozled at the incredible questions that I ask. And a lot of times I just say, oh yeah, yeah, that's just, that's just the way I speak, you know, and <laughs> I haven't given you as much credit as you deserve um, for the incredible work that you've done. And I like to pretend like I did it because it's so incredible, but Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm, 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 com I'm comfortable with that, Samantha. You, okay. you, you don't have to give, just just keep nodding at them, and you know. And, yeah, but I'm I'm, I'm I'll myself will be doing it with their patients and yeah, and, yeah. and then with trainees. I'm thinking about when I've um, done d dignity therapy with people or asked these important questions of my patients and their families. How good it feels as the clinician, like as a clinician, it feels incredible to lean in and be present and is the antidote often for clinician helplessness where you feel like you want to run away 
um, providing this type of brief intervention makes you feel like you're actually helping. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you have done any research or have heard about the um, ripple effect on the people who are administering uh, these uh, interventions. And if anyone has said anything about, uh, you know, how it makes them feel and how it changes their practice. The thing that we're interested with respect to healthcare providers uh, is the issue of burnout. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Burnout, job satisfaction, yeah. because we know that, I mean, one of the things that happens with burnout mm -hmm. is people start to emotionally disengage. Mm -hmm. So the PDQ in some ways would seem to me to be kind of a, an appropriate kind of uh, anecdotal strategy um, mm -hmm. in that rather than disengage, um, it mm -hmm. allows people to connect, you know, to find out, so who is this person? Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've done a little bit of work when we first published uh, the, the patient dignity uh, question. Uh, we looked at a group of both patients and, and family members. And remind me to say mm -hmm. something about families in a moment, mm -hmm. because I think it's, it's interesting. But mm -hmm. we've also looked at the, um, the way this affected healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. and, and what we've shown is uh, an association. So again, you can't talk about causality necessarily, but we've shown that there seems to be a connection between people who are receptive to the information gleaned from the patient dignity question mm -hmm. and job satisfaction mm -hmm. um, their kind of pre-morbid measures on of uh, of empathy mm -hmm. and as well a sense of of connectedness a sense of you know respecting that individual there was a, a small study that again that this one's i think no, that was a dignity therapy study. It wasn't a patient dignity question. So the study that we did indeed did show that there seems to be some association or connection between kind of your sense of job satisfaction mm -hmm. and your sense of, of empathy and connectedness and your receptiveness to this mm -hmm. information gleaned by way of the patient dignity question. That does not surprise me for one second because so many people who come to... Um, happen upon a palliative care rotation, probably because they've uh, avoided another rotation in internal medicine and they think they're gonna take basket weaving or something like that. But when they do get to you as a learner, a resident medical student, they often say, I can't believe this rotation. It reminds me of why I went into medicine. There's something about this uh, area of practice that is, um, yeah, bringing me home. and." It might be that uh, what you're studying is similar in a sense that it's this idea that somehow it gets trained out of us uh, to lean in and to be present and the types of um, interventions that you know, your work offers uh, puts people in the position of slowing down a bit and being present. Absolutely, and, and the other thing is that um... And again, because you know, th there's there's always pushback, and, and and one of the areas of pushback is that, um, you know, this is going to take too much time. Always, they always say that for everything. But you know what? It's um, upfront investment. It has payoffs all over the place, but it's hard to prove and measure. That's the problem. But you and I both know it's the best investment in everyone. And, and it's also something that doesn't need, necessarily need to take uh, inordinate amounts of time. I mean, you know, many of these conversations that we've had, I mean, uh, again, this is not hours on the telephone that we are having with these family members in ICU. We're talking about five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in five to 10 minutes, you know, if they can say, you know what, he was a champion curler. Um, really? Um, or, you know, this woman who tells us that, you know, that she was a residential school mm -hmm. student. I mean, what's what's profound is, you know, um, or, you know, I, I just was doing we were doing some teaching and uh, the uh, the person that I did a PDQ on told us that again, in the course of five minutes, besides saying, you know, this is a woman who had breast cancer, but besides saying, you know, that she had breast cancer and was kind of worried about that, she talked about the importance of, of beauty in her life. Mm -hmm. And also talked about the fact that what she was really worried about 
was her husband's immigration status because should something happen to her, she was his sponsor. And you think like when you get that kind of information, you think it's impossible to see that person the same ever again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how could you possibly treat them and think that you're offering, you know, person centered care or dignity centered care in the absence of knowing something so absolutely, you know, quintessentially vital to who they are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what PDQ stands for in the business world? I'm not sure I want to know, but you do uh, want to know because it's going to be what you tell people when they say it takes too much time. Oh, please. Pretty darn quick. <laughs> no, can you believe it? There's irony for you. <laughs> That's funny. That is ironic. You know, Harvey, I'm wondering, as we are talking about the research of PDQ, the patient dignity questionnaire or dignity therapy on patients and healthcare providers, what about the impact on families? When you're thinking about um, care, uh, I mean, whether you're providing care or whether you've been the recipient of care um, or whether a family member has been a recipient of care, the thing that you find uh, emotionally assaultive is when personhood goes unrecognized or unseen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, none of us want our loved one to be seen as, you know, just a patient. I mean, uh, you know, my mother died at the beginning of, of July. The thing that was most abrasive were those occasions when somebody would be treating her like, a, you know, a generic elderly woman. Mm -hmm. you know, my mother was not a generic elderly woman. My mother was Shirley Chachanov. And mm -hmm. to not, to treat her in a way that didn't offer her the respect that she deserved, that everyone deserves, by the way, mm -hmm. um, family members find that awful because it undermines their that that person's value and so you feel collectively devalued but the the study that we did on the pdq we said to ourselves well what if in palliative care uh, you run into instances where the patient him or herself can't answer the questions so we said well let, let's talk to the family member then let's see how that works and again, I can remember, and again, this is just one of many occasions, but I can remember gathering around the bedside of a patient, you know, and she was lying in bed. Uh, she was no longer verbal or conversant. And about three or four members of her family sat around her bedside and I was with them and said, so tell me about your mother. I mean, you know, like what, what would you want the healthcare team to know about your mom mm -hmm. so that they get it, you know, so that they know who they're looking after. And we had this, I mean, it was a lovely conversation. And again, this did not go on for hours. I mean, it was a brief conversation. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, getting to the, uh, so now pulling out the researcher hat, what was interesting is that when we evaluated the effect of the PDQ on healthcare providers, mm -hmm. we found the identical beneficial results, whether or not it was the patient who was an informant mm -hmm. or the family member who was an informant. So the bottom line, you know, mm -hmm. when your day comes and you know, you're, whether you're nearing the end, you can no longer speak on your own behalf. If you're unable to answer those questions, mm -hmm. if your family members can say, well, you know, this is who they are, the mm -hmm. benefits in terms of the effect on the healthcare provider, th their change in perspective is mm -hmm. identical. I mean, wow, that's amazing. I mean, all of it. I mean, you've accomplished so much in your career in research, have had so much impact. You've also written some popular books. Your first book, Dignity Therapy, came out several years ago. And I know you have another book coming out this month, November 2022. Can you tell us more about this new book? Uh, absolutely. And um, this time in my career, the idea of, uh, of, of legacy or thinking about things that, that I would want to uh, try and and contribute um, are, are trying to, are attempting to look at things that are maybe more um, upstream. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the the book that will be coming out in November is one called Dignity and Care: The Human Side of Medicine, and it it, it has not been written exclusively for uh, for palliative care. I think many of the insights that I've tried to uh, explain in detail come from a vantage point of having spent a lot of time in palliative care. 
But as you've pointed out, you know, in today's conversation, I mean, many of the insights that we're talking about, I mean, transcend all of medicine and, and, and all of life for that matter. I mean, the notion of needing to be seen, um, that just doesn't happen to us, you know, in the last six months of life where we suddenly discover that we want to be recognized um, or affirmed. You know, it, it applies, you know, from, from cradle to grave. I mean, we need to be acknowledged, recognized, nurtured. And so hopefully, uh, you know, with, within the pages of that book, I've been able to provide some insights and some tools as to how people who are working in healthcare Mm -hmm. and look at these uh, tasks as being ones that are fundamental to the idea of being a competent healthcare provider or a person working in healthcare. Because again, I think these things apply to, you know, not only those who are doing bedside care, but anybody who has patient contact, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, the, uh, an abrasive reception um, from somebody at a triage desk Mm -hmm. can be really uh, very difficult on somebody who's already feeling fragile. So I, I think the message needs to be that if you have contact with patients, mm -hmm. there are certain core efficiencies when it comes to the humanities of care mm -hmm. that you're responsible for. I mean, you know, there's no absolving you mm -hmm. from those, uh, from that skill set. And if you don't have it, then, you know, you really shouldn't be working in medicine. Your next for your next decades, um, would you think about somehow developing something that patients and families could have in their hands from the time that they're diagnosed with some kind of serious illness that they can extract from the system what the system is sometimes uncomfortable initiating? Um, so that all the work that you're doing to change how healthcare providers interact with patients and families, really the patients and families are still at the mercy of whether or not said healthcare person buys into that. Um, and so it would be wonderful to think that you could have the other side of your work being someone like me who's a patient could know what to do because Dr. Chachanov has taught me how to be this patient who will be able to get what I need to remain me out of the system without waiting for the system to ask me who I am. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really evocative question. And, and I think one in some ways um, that I have um, been encouraged to think about by, by the two of you um, because of, you know, the work that you're doing. I mean, it really is a revolutionary idea, you know, the, thinking about, you know, the people in the waiting room and, and empowering those people. Um, the truth is, uh, you know, until some of the recent conversations that the three of us have had, mm -hmm. I mean, I have been very much focused on the healthcare provider side of the equation, you know, providing them the insights, providing them the tools, providing them the means by which to deliver this care. But, you know, what, what your question reminds me of is, I remember years ago, uh, and again, this harkens back to uh, to my Carlos with the Canadian Virtual Hospice and talking about, you know, some of the big challenges in palliative care. And one of his responses was that we need to get um, people in, in the general public to have higher expectations. Yes. That yes. we need to teach them, but they, they need to somehow know that they should expect more, yeah. which is, you know, a, a, a profound uh, insight. I mean, um, and again, when you raise the idea with me about in empowering patients and, and, and families, um, it, it's somewhat of an epiphany. And so, uh, I mean, because I, I have been wondering, so, you know, you know, you know, is there another book left in me? I mean, is there another decade of work left to do some additional work? And if so, I mean, where to channel that? And, and certainly, you know, your ideas about trying to empower patients, you know, um, potential patients, which really refers to um, all of us, right? Uh, we're we're yeah. all potential patients, uh, you know, would be an important endeavor. That's what, you know, yes, welcome to the revolution, because that's what we're saying is all of us, unless we're suddenly stricken by lightning or something like that, we're going to be patients. And why not know how to remain Sammy? Like, 
give me advice, Dr. Chachanov, I'm just rolling, about how I can best go through this journey and still feel I'm familiar to myself, um, no matter what kind of doctor or nurse or receptionist I come involved, you know, be, um, interface with. I, I want to know how I can bring my CV or my uh, PDQ <laughs> forward um, and offer it up. Um, and how to do that. And what if I met with this or that? That's the kind of thing we're thinking of um, as well. Not, not in the exact same way, but it was a complete shift for us. Uh, still, having said that, I am definitely buying your book. And I'm definitely, I can't wait to read it. Um, because your work has had such a huge influence on uh, my entire career. It's not just an impact on palliative care at the bedside. So much about what you're talking about, seeing people as who they are, their dignity, those ideas are at the heart of person-centered care and about humanizing healthcare. And also it's related to this idea of health equity and social justice, because those are also rooted in the idea that we can't make assumptions about what the standard of care is, but we have to be present and listen and ask. Mm. You know, the other thing I think about the... Um, the dignity questions is that like, let's say you're a care provider that's a little bit nervous about saying the right things to the right populations. Like, you know, I also am learning and unlearning what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, but your questions uh, from your work, Harvey, are just very human centered and at the core of any population, I think is what you're talking about, which is people want to be seen and heard and um, recognized. And I don't know, I find the language of your work very comfortable for me as a provider, so that mm -hmm. I don't have to trip over, you know, knowing what to say or not say. Maybe that's a cop out, I still want to know what to say and what not to say, but it still, uh, it still gives me confidence. Uh, that I that these questions are for anyone, are they not? Like anyone, it doesn't matter what culture you're from or what, like who who would not respond to something like, what do I need to know about you to provide you the best care? Like, isn't that incredible? I don't have to know. Yeah, and, and, and asking somebody, you know, what I need to know about you as a person uh, to take the best care of you possible, I mean, also has connected with that, uh, I mean, this quality of, uh, of humility, um, yeah. that, that, that we are not making assumptions, you know, based on who you are, or, you know, what neighborhood you've come from, or how you, we're, we're not making those mm -hmm. assumptions. So I think, you know, um, very much connected with this is this whole idea of therapeutic humility, which is something I, I, I've also written about, which, mm -hmm. I mean, I think is a, it's a really important uh, concept for uh, healthcare providers to understand yes. because we are so ingrained in, in our work to think that um, we make a diagnosis, um, which means that we come to some formulation of the problem for which there is always uh, a solution. Yeah. You know, that's sort of the medical model. Uh, therapeutic humility turns that on its head and says, you know, there there are really some things uh, in medicine and, and some things in life um, for which there is no easy formulation. Mm -hmm. And there certainly is no readily available solution. Mm -hmm. And so therapeutic humility is recognizing that mm -hmm. and, and still showing up. You know, it's why, yes. you know, if we're doing um, a, a bereavement call, we show up. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that we have magical words to say that are mm -hmm. going to take away pain, mm -hmm. but we just acknowledge that our presence in the absence of having a way of making it better mm -hmm. matters. So therapeutic humility. I love that. Like not making assumptions about how we see people. You know, that reminds me about some of the more recent articles you've been publishing about this idea you've coined called the platinum rule. For the listeners, can you explain what is the platinum rule? You know, and that's the idea that very oftentimes in, in medicine, I mean, the golden rule would be, you know, we, we treat people the way that we think 
we would want to be treated or our family members would want to be treated. And of course, the golden rule is something you can find in most religious traditions and is very important. I mean, it, it is not a bad thing to know to use yourself as a gauge of, you know, what somebody else might want or how they would want to be treated. But the platinum rule recognizes that there can be a, a vast and profound disconnect between our worldview and our experience and that of our patient. And it is not, we are not the perfect measure, you know, the perfect barometer of what somebody else wants or needs. And so the platinum rule says, let's not do unto others as we would want done unto ourselves. Let's do unto others as they would want done unto themselves. And uh, I've published a, a couple of articles on this one that came out in the Journal of Palliative Medicine and more recently, one that came out in uh, JAMA Neurology. And the JAMA Neurology one, uh, I actually used the story of my, my late sister, Ellen. And, and I called the piece, Seeing Ellen, uh, the Platinum Rule. Uh, Ellen uh, was born with and grew up with cerebral palsy and was her life was very much shaped and her body very much misshaped uh, by cerebral palsy. And without kind of giving away, you know, everything that is contained in the article, it basically talks about the way um, she, uh, and it, although it recounts one occasion, but on many occasions was not seen. You know, she was seen through the lens of an able-bodied person who saw somebody whose body was shaped like a pretzel. And based on that would make assumptions on, you know, well, how would a pretzel want to be treated? If I were a pretzel, how would I want to be treated? And again, I mean, these terms are, are coarse and crass, but the, the, the sad truth is uh, many people, well, all of us, in fact, we come to the bedside with certain uh, biases and assumptions, uh, not because we're bad people necessarily, but simply because we are socialized to see things in a particular way. You know, you, you can't help grow up uh, in, in our Western society without valuing certain things or seeing things as being given more value than others. So youth and, and power and vitality, uh, wealth, those are the things that we elevate uh, above, you know, most other things and and everything else falls somewhere you know by the wayside and so again the, the platinum rule is just a reminder mm -hmm. that um we come at this with a very different worldview and and don't assume that we understand what someone's lived reality is uh, because they're going to make decisions based on their outlooks and not based on on ours Harvey, I can't believe it. We have covered a lot today and we also are out of time. So thank you for joining us. It has been a pleasure. I feel like you've made me a better doctor. I seriously do. I credit well, you for that. Thank you. So, I, I mean, uh, and who could ask for, uh, for a higher compliment than that, Samantha? Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shilpa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketseth.